people continue to be either oblivious to the fact that this information exists or completely resistant to looking at this information. So the question becomes why? Why is it that people have so much trouble hearing this information? From my work, I think we would be remiss not to look at the impact of trauma. My name is Marty Hopper, and I'm a PhD clinical psychologist. I've been working and living for the past 30 years here in Boulder, Colorado. For the past 11 years, my work has focused on helping people who have experienced personal trauma. I'm Fran Shore, and I have a master's degree from the University of Colorado. I've had a private practice as a psychotherapist and as a licensed professional counselor for about 20 years. Why do people resist this information, the information that shows that the official story about which is that there is evidence that shows that the official story cannot be true? So now we've lost our sense of security. We are starting to feel vulnerable cannot be true. What I've learned is that as humans, each of us have a worldview, and that worldview is usually formed in great part by the culture we grow up in. When we hear information that contradicts our worldview, social psychologists call the, result, the resulting insecurity cognitive dissonance. Challenges some of our most fundamental beliefs about our government and about our country. When your beliefs are challenged or when two beliefs are inconsistent, cognitive dissonance is created. It challenges the beliefs that our country protects us and keeps us safe and, and that America is the good guy. My name is Bob Hopper and I have a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Cincinnati. For the past 29 years, I've been a licensed PhD clinical psychologist in Boulder, Colorado. When your beliefs are challenged, fear and anxiety are created. In response to that, our psychological defenses kick in and they protect us from, our, from these emotions. Denial, which is probably the most primitive psychological defense, is the one most likely to kick in uh, when our beliefs are challenged. I'm Danielle Dupre, PhD, originally from Switzerland where I studied psychology and psychoanalysis. For the past 15 years, I've been empowering people who have experienced significant trauma. America is a powerful nation. It has never been attacked. We were confident, we, were, we felt secure, and all of a sudden that security collapsed. People started to be fearful. With all those rumors, those news, people didn't know what to think about. And it's a very, very uncomfortable state to be in and eventually our mind shuts off. Just like when a computer is overloaded, our minds get overloaded. We can't handle it anymore and we shut down. It's easier to deny it and move on with our lives. What some of us will tend to do is deny the evidence that's coming our way and stick to the original story, the official story, and to try to regain our equ equilibrium in that way. Another thing we can do is decide to look at the conflicting evidence and be sincere and be open-minded and look at both sides of the issue and then make up our own mind about what reality is. I'm Dorothy Lorig. I have a master's degree in counseling psychology from the University of Colorado and I've been practicing reevaluation counseling for over 16 years. If we can think of our worldview as being sort of our mental and emotional home, I think all of us will do just about anything to defend our homes, to defend our families. And, and so I see that with people, and I saw that with myself when my brother tried to talk with me about it, of don't mess with me, don't mess with my home, don't mess with my comfort with how things, how things are. And it was a very well-researched article. I was in my office at the time. I sat there, and I felt my stomach churning. I thought maybe I was going to be sick. And I leaped out of my chair and ran out the door and took a, a long walk around the block, around several blocks, um, and just broke down. I understand now that what was happening was my worldview about my government being in some way my protector, almost like a parent had been dashed and uh, it was like being cast out into the wilderness I think is the closest way to describe that feeling and I sobbed and I sobbed 
felt like the ground had completely disappeared beneath my feet. And, and I knew at some point during the walk that I knew that I was going to have to become active in educating other people about this, that there was, that for me to retain any sense of integrity, I was going to have to take some action. I couldn't just let something like this go. Many people respond to these truths in a very deep way. Some have a visceral reaction like they've been punched in the stomach. To begin to accept the possibility that the government was involved is like opening Pandora's box. If you open the lid and peek in a little bit, it's, it, it's going to challenge some of your fundamental beliefs about the world. Well, here are a few of those, uh, those spontaneous initial reactions to hearing the contradictory evidence about... I don't want to know the truth or I'd become too negative and psychologically go downhill. I'm not sure I want to know. If this is true, then up would be down, and down would be up. My life would never be the same. Fran, I refuse to believe that that many Americans could be that treasonous. Someone would have talked. But these are beliefs. They are not scientific facts. But these beliefs do keep us from looking at the empirical evidence. I'm David Ray Griffin. I taught uh, philosophy of religion and theology at the Claremont School of Theology and Claremont Graduate University. You have uh, e empirical people who will simply say, look at the evidence, and if it's convincing, I will change my mind. Other people are paradigmatic people. They have a paradigm. They say, this is the way the world works, and I'm I'm convinced this is the right way the world works for that paradigm. So I don't need to look at the evidence. It's paradigmatic. And then there is a third type of person that uh, we often call wishful thinkers. Um, I call it wishful and fearful thinking. So they simply will not believe something that they fear to be the truth. And I found that maybe to be the most powerful factor of uh, people rejecting truth and not even entertaining the evidence. So whenever we say, I refuse to believe, we can be sure that the evidence that's coming our way is not bearable and that it's, going, it's conflicting with our worldview much too much. Denial protects people from this kind of anxiety. As I thought about all of these responses, I realized that what is common to every one of them is the emotion of fear. People are afraid of being ostracized, they're afraid of being alienated, they're afraid of being shunned, they're afraid of their lives being inconvenienced, they'd have to change their lives, they're afraid of being confused, they're afraid of psychological deterioration, they're afraid of feeling helpless and vulnerable. And they're afraid that they won't be able to handle the feelings that are coming up. None of us want to feel helpless and vulnerable. So we want to defend ourselves. And the way we often do that is with anger. So then we become angry. And when we become angry, then we become indignant. We become offended. We want to ridicule the messenger. We want to pathologize the messenger. And we want to censor the messenger. So how can we overcome this resistance and denial? The first thing is to meet people where they're at. One thing is that we need to raise people's awareness about this through what I would call gentle dialogue and gentle questioning. My name is John Freedom. I'm a counselor in private practice here in Tucson, Arizona, which I've been for the past 20 years. I hold a master's level certification in NLP, which is neurolinguistic programming. So it doesn't work to challenge people's belief or immediately tell them, you know, I know that. But a good way is to ask questions, ask open-ended questions, and lead them into a dialogue and discussion about it. One of the ways to deal with a trauma is to find the answers. That's why I think it is of such importance to have a comprehensive investigation. I believe that to be the kind of country that we think we are, we have to face some of the things that are not as we think they are. I'm Robert Griffin. I am a licensed psychologist practicing in Pennsylvania 
for 25 years. I am a member of Psychologists for Social Responsibility, and I am past president of the Northeastern Pennsylvania Psychological Association. Thinking that we're above uh, such things, that it could happen in other countries, but it couldn't happen here, that's a lack of humility, and that's excessive pride. And so not being able to see our dark side or our weaknesses is the most dangerous thing. The observation that pride is one of the basic human flaws is, um, is absolutely correct. Um, this is especially true for Americans because we long, uh, for a long time, looked at other nations and say, oh, they're in such bad shape, but luckily we don't have those problems. We don't have leaders who would uh, do those things that were done uh, in, in uh, the Soviet Union or done in Germany or done in uh, Japan and on down the, the list. So this is a type of pride that Americans have. A feature of American history that makes us uh, particularly uh, liable to this pride is um, this notion that's, of, that's called exceptionalism, that America is the exceptional nation. And that uh, began from the beginning as, the, as this country was uh, formed. Uh, the people would say, well, there was so much evil in the European country, so much uh, cheating, so much uh, lying, so much uh, using the people for the ruler's purposes, but not in America. We have leaders that are free from those sins. Um, so I think this has made particularly difficult for Americans. Anyone can make mistakes, but our ideals and our principles get us back you know, on track. This is one of the defining issues of our time. So we need to understand that questioning is, uh, is patriotic. Questioning is what we're supposed to do as citizens. That's our duty. We need to be sure that we have a real investigation into who the perpetrators are, and then we need to be sure that those perpetrators are held legally accountable. It's part of the healing process on the individual level as on the collective level. We need the truth in order to heal. Thank you. We're going to be on the roof. 872 Y A T E F O Alaska. 872 Y E O. Possible suspect vehicle. Rodia, R-O-D-I-A, Christopher A.